if you were communism, it meant a kind of equality of poverty. Everybody gets to share among themselves a tiny bit of whatever they're able to produce. And what Lesordo points out is that Deng really criticized this idea and instead insisted on if socialism is really unleashing the full productive forces of humanity, then there sh it should be bountiful. Fascism is supported by the capitalist ruling class, not just in Germany, Italy, and Japan, but also in the United States and among the other imperialist powers in order to crush you and genocidally eliminate the Bolsheviks. And so one of the things that Stalin had to do, and that's, I think, how we have to understand Stalin. You can have your criticisms. You can look at positive things that Stalin did, because at the end of the day, he led the global struggle against fascism and helped defeat and was the greatest force in defeating Nazism. He's capitalism's court jester. Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. If you're new to if you're new to our channel, please smash the subscribe button. You can also be a member to support us. In either case, like, share, and subscribe our channel and do watch our show. Let me introduce our guest today, Professor Gabriel Rockhill. Professor Rockhill is an American philosopher, writer, and a cultural critique. He is professor of philosophy at Villanova University and director of the Critical Theory Workshop with whom we are collaborating this show. Professor Rockhill, welcome to welcome back to India and Global Left. Thanks so much for having me back. It's a pleasure. I want to discuss Domenico Lusordo's new book. Um, it was originally published right before he passed away in 2018, but the English version had just uh, come out and you have edited the book. What did it mean to edit the book? What can viewers expect from the book? The name of the book is Marxism, Western Marxism, how it was born, how it died, how it can be reborn. So Lusordo was, in my opinion, one of the kind of titans of the latter part of the 20th and early 21st century. And the work that he did included the publication of some 50 manuscripts in Italian, but very few of them are available in English. In fact, uh, the last time I counted, it's only about 10 of them. And this particular book on Western Marxism was his penultimate uh, work. And in it, he seeks to respond to the arguably most well-known accounts of Western Marxism, those by Perry Anderson, who had written two books uh, on precisely this topic and present a very different version of Western Marxism than what you get in Perry Anderson. And I'm happy to go into that if you want to kind of unpack Anderson's position versus Lesordo's position. But in short, what he diagnoses in the book is how in the deep history of the Marxist tradition, there is a version of Marxism that emerged in the West, although he's not really using this as a geographic category so much as an ideological category. So we could say also in the imperial core, in the kind of Euro-American world, along with all of its appendages. And the version of Marxism that emerged within that world was a version that was quite perverted in relationship to the deeper history of Marxism as it contributed to struggles of building actually existing socialism. So the opposite of Western Marxism, if you will, for simplistics or for the sake of simplicity would be Eastern Marxism. Again, not so much geographically as it is the Marxism that manifested itself in material projects in the real world, beginning, of course, in, you know, at least most uh, flagrantly, if you will, with 1917 and the Russian Revolution, but then continuing in the East with the Chinese Revolution, the Vietnamese struggle, the Korean struggle, etc., in Laos and elsewhere. And so these categories shouldn't really be understood in terms of West and East so much as in terms of the version of Marxism that developed within the capitalist core versus the version of Marxism that developed as a kind of anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggle within the periphery and, of course, being led in many ways by the East. But you find, quote unquote, Eastern Marxism in other places, if it be in Nicaragua or in Cuba, which, of course, would be usually categorized 
categorized in the Western Hemisphere. So that's at least a very quick overview of the book, but I'm happy to go into any of the details. I think if you could tell us a little bit about the importance of placing imperialism at the center of um, theoretical understanding of socialism or even theories within Marxism, because many a times it's, uh, it's very tempting to start about socialism from capitalism and there is an economic, there is a tendency to think of socialism as an economic system, uh, at least that's maybe my instinct because I do mostly economics and economic history. When I read this book, it felt that the beginning of socialism is with imperialism and anti-imperialism. And that's what runs through the book. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that Lesordo's understanding of imperialism, it varies between kind of two different levels of analysis because at one level, he's talking about imperialism in general, meaning the long history of how the capitalist core countries underdeveloped the global south or the third world in order to develop itself through a whole series of mechanisms you know unequal exchange direct colonization you know there's there's many aspects to this but he's also Lesordo that is drawing of course on Lenin's insightful analysis uh you know at the early part of the 20th century of imperialism being more specifically the highest phase or highest stage of capitalism and this is when finance capital becomes the dominant form of uh, global capital. But it also is a moment at which the colonial endeavors of the capitalist countries have saturated the world, meaning that there's no longer any countries available for colonization because they've already been colonized. So the world enters into a phase of inter-imperialist rivalry, which really played itself out in World War I and, for that matter, through the course of World War II. And so Lesordo's horizons for thinking Western Marxism are really specifically beginning with the what Lenin called the split in the world socialist movement. And that occurred uh, in this kind of highest phase of capitalism or imperialism when the Western Marxists, particularly the European Marxists, the leaders of major political parties, uh, lined up on their national bourgeoisies, supported World War I, and many of them also supported colonialism and were direct about that. Against that, you have the position taken by Lenin and a number of others, you know, Luxembourg, Zetkin, etc., who, um, you know, even though there were debates between Lenin and Luxembourg, so I don't want to paste over that, but the basic position was that uh, the European Marxist tradition was being social chauvinist. They were taking ideological positions that were based on how they were situated materially in the history of imperialism, meaning that they were members of what, you know, Lenin called the labor aristocracy. The labor aristocracy is composed of the workers in the global north who, yes, are exploited, are subjected to capitalist social relations, but compared to workers in the semi-colonial and colonial periphery, they're at the very top of that pyramid. So they form a kind of aristocracy within the global working class. That meant that there was an economic force driving the orientation of those Western Marxists who ended up supporting the bourgeoisie, supporting the inter-imperialist rivalry, and many of them supporting colonialism, right? So here, just to connect it directly with what you said about the economic forces driving history, it's true that in Lesordo's book, he's not foregrounding economic history, but it's very much implicit within his argument that the structural framing is Lenin's understanding of imperialism, hence an understanding of the extent to which the deep history of imperialism has produced an ideological version of Marxism in the imperial core among the labor aristocracy and another version of Marxism among the workers who are the most oppressed and uh, downtrodden in the world, meaning those in the semi-colonial and colonial periphery. So in that regard, there is ultimately a kind of very broad economic framing, if you will, that undergirds these two ideologies. And maybe the last thing that I'll say on that is that what Lesordo is doing in this book is obviously it's primarily a critique of 
he doesn't focus so much on the Western Marxism and its origins, although he does talk about, you know, the debates between Kautsky and Lenin and things like this. He's more concerned with from about the mid 20th century until the end of his life or near the end of his life, the kind of Marxist stars of the imperial theory industry. Right. So these are people like Slavoj Žižek, Alain Badiou, Antonio Negri, Michael Hart and, and many, many others. And he's concerned with how that legacy has basically continued because these are people who are situated at the very top of what we might call the intellectual labor aristocracy. They're the prime intellectuals in the imperial core, and they're at the very top of these kind of global pyramids of labor, even including uh, intellectual labor in this specific case. And his orientation, Lasorda's orientation, is really towards a positive project of rejuvenating a version of Marxism that is thoroughly anti-imperialist and centers imperialism as really the primary uh, overarching structure of the contemporary world, and hence the struggle against imperialism being the very beating heart, if you will, of the structure of the struggle for socialism. And Lenin, of course, said that the way in which class struggle plays itself out in an imperialist world is a class struggle between nations. And so the struggle for national liberation is, or at least in many cases, is a class struggle between the colonized and semi-colonized periphery and the imperialist countries that try to control them, right? So in that sense, we have Western Marxism might be better defined as a kind of imperial Marxism and Eastern Marxism as a kind of anti-imperialist Marxism, a Marxism of the anti-colonial and anti-imperialist periphery. One of the things I picked up from the book is something that's not very clearly laid out, but has been repeated throughout uh, the book, and maybe like I'm seeking for more explanation, is a lot of the positions that many of these Western scholars that the book deal with, deals with, from Anderson to Adorno, Horkheimer, Aaron, Zizek, Althusser, and so on, the claim is that it is born out of the kind of material conditions that they are embedded in, which is the relation of the West to the global South. From there, it seems that the claim is that they are very directly uh, complicit in imperial project. Um, is that the claim or is the claim that they are, they somehow misunderstand the real material conditions of the global South? I would say both, meaning that one of the enormous problems in, and you're absolutely right, that, you know, the book could also be entitled a kind of critique of the Western left intelligentsia, because in many ways, someone like Arendt was very anti-Marxist. Adorno and Horkheimer said they were Marxist, but I think are quintessentially anti-Marxist. Um, so it's a, it's a broader critique than just focusing on Marxists per se, but that one of the problems with the Western left intelligentsia is a kind of ingrained ignorance regarding imperialism and its history. And what's implicit in the book is that this ignorance comes out of the ways in which these intellectuals are trained. They're trained in such a way that they are cushioned from the effects of imperialism. When they travel the world, they travel in very elite circles and international junkets in which they're not really exposed to the real workings of imperialism. And the premier institutions in the imperial core, if it be the universities, the publishing houses, the conference circuit, uh, and other such things, uh, really do foster that type of imperial ignorance. In fact, just as a side note, a lot of my own work also draws on Lesordos, and I'm currently finishing a book entitled Who Paid the Pipers of Western Marxism? And one of the things that it points out is that there is an imperial superstructure, meaning that there is an ideological apparatus that has arisen in the imperial core that includes all of the ways in which intellectuals are trained. This is not just the university, then it's also the journalistic and media world, the cultural world, etc., that imbues them with this profound ignorance regarding the real history of imperialism. But the other aspect of this is also absolutely true, just to uh, make sure I deal with both parts of your question, and that is that the majority of these thinkers, now there are differences, but many of them were direct and explicit supporters of imperialism. 
Max Horkheimer, for instance, was a defender of the U.S. imperialist war in Vietnam and is on record saying that when the U.S. goes to war, people might claim that it's in some other interest, but ultimately what it is is a war defending constitutional rights, human rights, democracy, and other such things. Uh, Lesordo points out that um, Michael Hart has taken very similar positions on particular uh, interventions on the part of the imperialist powers. Uh, Adorno, you know, was more loath to take public political positions, but he did support certain uh, positions such as the joint intervention on the part of the Israeli government, the French and the British in the uh, war over the Suez Canal, which he thought, you know, was worthy of support. Both he and Horkheimer referred to Nasser as a fascist and described what they called the quote unquote Arab robber states who were threatening to destroy Israel. They were, so they were also in support of the settler colonial project in Israel. You know, there are many other examples, but maybe just in the interest of nuance, it is also true that there are figures who are kind of occupy more of a left-wing position within this broader Western left intelligentsia. So someone like Alain Badiou has spoken out against NATO interventions. He wasn't in support of Libya. Jean-Luc Nancy, a famous French philosopher, supported the intervention in Libya. Uh, along the lines of a kind of liberal ideological orientation. And Badiou soundly criticized him for that. But when you look at one of Badiou's closest collaborators, Slavoj Žižek, he is not only in support for the, or has expressed his fulsome support for the NATO proxy war in the Ukraine against Russia, but he has made outlandish statements that are really unhinged from reality about how China is fascist, and he's really lined up on the NATO project in many, many ways. And so, you know, one of the things that Lasordo doesn't say explicitly, but I take as implicit in his project, is that in the Western left intelligentsia, there's an ideological field, and people occupy different positions within this field. Some are much more reactionary, like uh, Horkheimer was a very reactionary, quote unquote, Marxist. Some are much more progressive, like Bedu. Hannah Arendt is a kind of anti-Marxist whose earlier work, I think, was much more progressive, but her later work, I mean, she basically made excuses for both racial segregation and for slavery. And so they've taken very reactionary positions. And so the overall takeaway, I think, for people reading this book should be a very, very healthy dose of skepticism regarding how leftist the so-called leftist uh, Western intelligentsia actually is. Uh, just real quick, can you reference uh, Aaron's um, uh, endorsement of racial segregation and slavery? Which yeah, one? well, she said th this was in her. I mean, she has a very famous piece on the attempt to desegregate public schools in the United States and recommended against it um, publicly. And the case of slavery is more complicated because there are discrepancies between because Arendt, of course, was originally a German speaker, but then wrote in English. And in her book on revolution, if you compare the original German edition to the English edition, there are some significant discrepancies between them. But in the German edition of on revolution, she makes the argument that slavery has been the necessary condition for the development of politics in the Laurentian sense. So the opportunity for uh, people to get together and discuss freely the political issues of the day. And so labor needs to be taken care of in order to have politics proper. And historically, she says that the conditions of possibility for politics proper has been satisfied by slavery. And so there's an, it's not an explicit justification. She doesn't say, yeah, slavery is great. I really support it. But she says that it's the condition of possibility for what she considers to be the most important thing politically. And she argues then that developments in modern technology have, um, you know, in the contemporary age, created a situation where reliance on slavery is no longer necessary. And so in that regard, I take it that she has given us an implicit justification for slavery insofar as it's a condition of possibility of politics in the, pro in the Orentian sense of that term. And there are other things about Arendt that I could mention. I mean, she, 
The second half of Origins of Totalitarianism benefited from support from the British Foreign Office. She had many connections to the networks of the Central Intelligence Agency and to British intelligence networks and profited handsomely from that, as well to the capitalist ruling class. The Rockefeller interests in particular uh, wined and dined and provided support to Arendt for the anti-communist scholarship that she was doing. I think the second half of Origins of Totalitarianism also brings us to this important question of the Soviet Union back then. And now one can think about China, how they divided uh, the left and more precisely the Western left. I think that's something um, very um, explicitly, I think Lusordo very explicitly defends that um, Soviet Union, China, Cuba, and, and all those places where revolutions happened, they have to be defended and there has to be a very direct, explicit solidarity with the revolutions. Uh, an issue where many of those in the West who also call them Marxists otherwise, and also um, aspired for revolutions in their own ways um, were divided. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, in many ways, that's the fundamental dividing line through the course of the book. It's that the Western Marxist so-called or the Western left intelligentsia in this broader sense has generally, with a very few exceptions, been opposed to actually existing socialism in more or less any way, shape or form. And people should know that this is also the case with those who present themselves as having a new idea of communism, being the real Marxist revolutionaries. So if it be Zizek, Badiou, Negri, Hart, and people like this, um, there are tiny exceptions that one can find in their writings, but for the most part, they condemn socialism across the board. Lesordo takes the opposite position, and just to be clear, it's not a kind of naive embrace of anything that goes under the flag of socialism. Lesordo's understanding of socialism is that it's a practical process of learning. And that what socialism in the real world looks like is an attempt to break the chains of imperialism. And that in doing that, we have only had socialist experiments that have been subjected to the brutal onslaught of the imperialist powers. So we should actually expect in real socialism various perversions due to the fact that socialism has never been allowed to occupy the world stage freely, autonomously, and develop as it would like to. Socialism has always had to develop according to the dictates of the imperialist powers. And so a much more materialist and historical materialist understanding of socialism goes in this direction, right, and, and, and recognizes that. And in Lesordo's case, I think he's one of the most brilliant analysts of the evolution of the global struggle to build socialism, because he doesn't just kind of drive a stake down and say, well, this is what socialism is. He recognizes it as it's very dialectical. It's an ongoing process. And so he has critiques of Stalin in his famous book on Stalin, of the Soviet Union. In the Sino-Soviet split, he aligned himself on the Sino side of that split and supported China from very early on. But he also has had some criticisms of China in its development. But he always sees this process of learning being such that the Chinese experiment, and this goes on today, was learning from both the successes and the mistakes of Soviet-style socialism. And so what Lesordo is encouraging us to do is not, you know, the Western Marxist or Western intelligentsia often tries to impose this very Manichaean binary, where you either blindly support all forms of socialism and are some type of neo-Stalinist or whatever else they might want to slander people as, or you recognize that all forms of socialism are just corrupt and don't live up to the true idea of socialism that people in the uh, West have in their minds. Lesordo isn't taking either of those positions. He's giving us a nuanced, dialectical, and materialist analysis of the actual process, difficult and contradictory process of building socialism in an imperialist world. How did he look at the Soviet Union? Uh, how do you mean? Um, uh, was, Favorably or not? Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or through the long um, history of Soviet Union, what was his assessment uh, of the Soviet Union? Well, it, the book on Lesordo is quite long, so I can't go into all of the details. But in short, he saw the Soviet Union as being the kind of driving wedge of the socialist anti-imperialist project. 
And so it was the first one that was charting unchartered territory. In that regard, he recognizes some of the important contradictions like Lenin introducing the new economic policy, which was allowing for capitalist investment in a socialist country. Uh, Lesordo doesn't cry foul and say, okay, now it's become capitalist as many people did with the reform and opening up in China. He also said, no, these are some of the, it's part of what I think we can describe as the dialectics of socialism. To get socialism off the ground in the real world, you have to deal with the imperialist world. And one way of doing that is integrating elements from the uh, capitalist world because it's the extant dominant world. But then the other thing that he does, I think, very importantly, is he situates Stalin, of course, who has been um, constantly slandered within the Western intelligentsia, within the real material history of what it means to not just try to build a socialist country, but a socialist country in which you know that fascism is supported by the capitalist ruling class, not just in Germany, Italy, and Japan, but also in the United States and among the other imperialist powers in order to crush you and genocidally eliminate the Bolsheviks. And so one of the things that Stalin had to do, and that's, I think, how we have to understand Stalin. You can have your criticisms. You can look at positive things that Stalin did, because at the end of the day, he led the global struggle against fascism and helped defeat and was the greatest force in defeating Nazism. So there's positives and negatives, but you always have to analyze it within a concrete situation. And that concrete situation was one in which all of the forces of the entire history of global imperialism were seeking, because uh, early on, of course, I mean, the history of World War II is a little bit complicated in why Hitler opened up the Western Front and things like that, but there was massive support for what Hitler said he was gonna do. And that was his fundamental goal, laid it out in Mein Kampf, I'm going to destroy the Soviet Union. And the capitalists love this guy. And that's why they showered him with money. And so what Stalin had to do was develop the productive forces as quickly as possible. And there's the famous quote, I'm probably going to misquote it, but he basically said something like the West is 50 or 100 years ahead of us. If we don't make that up in 10 years, they're going to crush us. And he was absolutely 100% right. So what that meant is that under Stalin, there was an enormous amount of draconian pressure that was put to develop the productive forces. Enormous contradictions, uh, unbelievable kind of you know authoritarian drive to try to keep the socialist project alive. And so one of the things that I think Lesordo does brilliantly is he doesn't shy away from those, those contradictions. He's not like, I love Stalin or I condemn Stalin. He says, all these moral categories that the Western left intelligentsia loves to embrace are devoid of materialist analysis. The world is not black and white. This isn't an issue of like believing in God or not or something like that. Let's shelve these moral, you know, these simplistic moralisms and let's look at the very complex process of trying to develop socialism in an imperialist world and balance out where we see positives, where we see negatives, and what we can learn, because that's the most important thing. What can we learn from mistakes that were made and where is there room for growth? And hence, you know, his analysis of China, I'd recommend his book, Class Struggle, which is available in English, where he kind of charts out China's development as in many ways learning from many of these mistakes uh, that the Soviet Union made. I think that's an important point given um... The PRC is still uh, still alive and growing so strong. I recently um, was in China, visited extensively in different cities across uh, China for three months, um, and it's um, it was a remarkable experience. Given you can see all forms of development, whether it's a, a lack of slums and beggary, or even people with leather clothes in Chinese cities, or when you look down from below, from the 15th floor of a hotel, uh, there are no slums. Um, it's uh, subways, um, you know, uh, the reforestation of its cities, which is remarkable. Like uh, if, if you compare it to India or even many parts of the West, and I think Lusordo's defense of reform and opening, as opposed to many of um, not just Western Marxists, but many Marxists who think of reform and opening as welcoming of uh, um, uh, 
Western capitalist class. Um, when you look at the ground, when you talk to people in China, almost nine out of 10 would take it for granted that since reform and opening, they have been greatly benefited. I mean, they are not the ones who would say that the earlier period was, um, was completely a mistake. They would say that uh, many of those things were uh, forced on us, many of those things were because it was a difficult condition, which was right. And, and they also achieved great things during the Maoist period. But almost everyone takes it for granted that since the reform and opening, China has made great progress, as opposed to many of those theoretical Marxists and other leftists who would try to condemn uh, reform and opening. So can you tell us a little bit about Lusordo's position on reform and opening? Yeah, it's a very important position because one of the things that he highlights is how Deng Xiaoping's uh, contribution, and of course, this is just a figurehead for the Chinese Communist Party, but then more generally the the um, the uh, Chinese people, and or at least many of them in the struggle to uh, solve certain problems that China was faced with, and that what Lesordo sees in Deng is that there was too much within the Marxist-Leninist tradition out of which he came that was beholden to a kind of moralizing, popperistic view of communism. So if you were communism, it meant a kind of equality of poverty. Everybody gets to share among themselves a tiny bit of whatever they're able to produce. And what Lesordo points out is that Deng really criticized this idea and instead insisted on if socialism is really unleashing the full productive forces of humanity, then there sh it should be bountiful and there should be actually a kind of common prosperity that comes out of the socialist project. And so he's very insistent on breaking with this idea that communists are just, you know, poor people huddled together in masses. Um, instead, it's about developing the productive forces in order to advance society to higher levels of what the Chinese are now calling, you know, kind of socialist modernization, if you will. And so that's a very important part of it. Another is that the way that Deng Xiaoping and the, the Chinese government, of course, went about the reform and opening up is that they didn't just open the spigot and say, OK, Goldman Sachs and everybody come on in, let's do this. It was very dialectical, very materialist. It had targeted uh, areas that they began with. They did studies to find out what was working, what was not working. They were adjusting it. And they kept the state in control, uh, in the control of the Communist Party. And they kept the towering heights in the banking sector uh, as, as state owned. And so it's not as if they just opened the floodgates. And again, so much of the Western left intelligentsia, and for that matter, those who uh, you know, seek to be integrated within it, within the the kind of comprador, if you will, the comprador class of the intelligentsia, really just sees this in binary terms. Uh, China is either socialist or it's entirely capitalist, as opposed to seeing it being socialism with Chinese characteristics and allowing in certain forms of capitalist investment in order to develop the productive forces in an imperialist world because they're forced to do that. And so in all of those ways, I think that Lesordo was very insightful and diagnosed this very early on, right, when almost all of the Western left intelligentsia was saying that China is done with. Maybe the last thing that I would say, and this will connect it to our discussion of the Soviet Union, is that what uh, Lesordo and there are other authors who have pointed this out as well, highlight is that in the case of China, they studied very closely the Soviet Union. An enormous problem that the Soviet Union had is that it was so successful in its process of industrialization that between about 1917 and about the 1970s, with the exception, of course, of the war years, it had an, uh, a process of industrialization that was truly off the charts, took a country that was, you know, a uh, third world, underdeveloped, et cetera, and really developed it to a very high level. I mean, they had a space program. Uh, they were, you know, leaders in, in many ways. But the, one of the difficulties, enormous difficulties that they had is that transitioning from the process of industrialization to new phases of production that were based on cybernetics, that were based on the kind of, you know, emerging later on digital revolution, they had trouble shifting gears in that regard. They began to fall behind the West, enter into the arms race and all of this. And so this is something as well that's very important in the reform and opening up because Deng Xiaoping had visited the factories in Japan and elsewhere, and he'd seen that 
it doesn't matter how hard the Chinese work. If they don't have technology on their side, they're never going to be able to develop as quickly. So one of the goals of the reform in opening up was technology transfer from the West. So you give us capitalist investment, but on one condition at least, and that is that we want technology transfer so that we can begin to both integrate the technologies from the imperialist powers, but then also learn to do, you know, produce those technologies ourselves as we see today with their, you know, uh, their leaders in electronic vehicle production and, and many other things. And so I think that's um, what Lesordo sees in this is the way that China has learned to deal with the imperialist world and not fall into some of the mistakes that the Soviet Union has made and deal with it in such a way that the relationship to the imperialist powers is much less rooted in just a frontal conflict. Although, of course, that's what the imperialist powers want. They want a new Cold War. That's what they're driving. That's what they have, really. But China has been pro-peace. They have not been advocating for uh, military conflict. They've not been putting military bases around the world or doing any of that. And a lot of that has to do with looking at the arms rates in the Soviet Union and how detrimental it was to ultimately, um, you know, where the Soviet Union ended up. I think one of the reasons why China has to be dissociated with socialism is, is precisely because of the technological uh, advance and progress that it is making. It's, it's almost embarrassing then to call China socialist because then you would end up saying that socialism can also produce great technology when I was in a hotel room. Can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, was in exactly. a hot, I was in a hotel um, in, in, in China and this was not like uh, five-star luxury hotel and there was a washing machine which was moving through its floors and it was um, you know it entered the lift and it was going to the laundry room uh, and there was just no one around it um, and it asked me like Nihal I mean I speak intermediate Chinese but I was thinking like it was talking to itself or something eventually I figured something. out the, the machine was talking to myself, he was, uh, to me, he was, he or she or whatever, the machine was greeting me like, how's your day and so on. Um, and that's the example I give here in India and people are like, so surprised. Um, you know, this yeah. is apart from, you know, the speed of uh, uh, the, the Gautier, the high speed railway, where you can- The high speed railway is incredible, right? Yes, All the maglev and, train. And it's incredibly accessible. Like you spend less in Chinese, High speed speed rails than you spend in Indian rails, and Indian rails are very cheap as well because they are very highly subsidized, uh, and you right. sp spend even less. So it's it's, it's incredibly more convenient. Um, I think um, something that I found interesting in Lusordo's book is his critique of the libertarian tendencies within socialist thinkers. Um, in so far as their rejection of uh, parties, political parties, um, and uh, and even the state, uh, while uh, the experience and history of existing socialist states or even other global South states, including I would say the West, has has revealed it very clearly that states are very essential to defend in the case of global south against imperialism, but also to defend against landlordism, against capitalism, um, you know, developing uh, people's material conditions and so on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about his critique of, I think he calls it messianism, populism and rebellionism? Yeah, I think that at, at the core of all three of these critiques is really the orientation of so many Western left intellectuals, but also uh, self-declared Marxists, of the party form and the state form. And so I see that as really a kind of anarchist orientation in many ways, because there's the assumption that any form of control, domination, vertical social organization is negative, just based on the form, regardless of the content. Right. So it's it's lacking in materialist analysis to assume that someone having authority over someone else is just a net negative without ever analyzing the substantive relationship that is operative in the actual content of that. And so their anti party, anti state orientation means that they often support 
we can start with rebellionism, rebellions against capitalist states, sometimes they will come out in support of, you know, the Occupy movement, for instance, or certain aspects of the square movements and the so-called Arab Spring. But at the same time, they'll support the Hong Kong protests, which are backed by Western intelligence agencies as an attempt to overthrow the Chinese government. And so you see the problems when you only analyze at a formal level and you don't look at the substance and the content of one of a political orientation. It's that any jacquerie or any uprising or rebellion is great and should be celebrated. Um, but there is one condition, and that is as long as they don't actually seize state power. Right. So we could take the example of Palestine. Fortunately, I mean, it depends on what figure we're talking about, but fortunately, some of the contemporary Western left intellectuals, now that there's a live stream genocide, have been critical of the uh, what the Israeli government backed and fully supported, of course, by the United States is doing. But if you would imagine a situation where the Palestinians not only succeeded in establishing a state, but then established a socialist state, the tone would change very, very quickly. Right. So rebellionism, as long as it is against any form of authority, but as soon as it actually gets organized, seizes state power and establishes a force that could resist imperialism, then it's a problem. And this then goes along with the messianism or it's, you know, Lesordo kind of identifies three light motifs, if you will. So rebellionism is one of them. The messianism, you see, not again in all of the Western Marxists, but there are many of them who have a kind of utopian idea of what socialism or communism should look like. So communism should be immediately the withering away of the state. You know, certain figures, I believe it's uh, Bloch who said this when, you know, a few years before the Nazis were marching on the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union, if it was really communist, should get rid of its state. So if you would imagine that the Soviet Union had abolished its state prior to the arrival of the Nazi, and it's basically an apology for Nazism because the Soviet Union would have been taken over. Um, and the messianism you also see in figures like Zizek, who's, you know, has this whole kind of Christian theology that's operative in his work. Bedu is a self-declared metaphysician and Platonist. And so the idea is that there's, there's this idea of communism that transcends actually existing socialism and capitalism. And all that we have to do is read and interpret their books and somehow we'll be imbued with this idea or gospel from them. And so there's even a messianic relationship uh, in which they position themselves as the messiah in relationship to everybody else. And the third leitmotif is, is populism. And for populism, Lesordo is in many ways drawing on Lenin's critique of populism as a kind of ideological position that celebrated the moral excellence of the downtrodden without actually scientifically analyzing the means by which one can effectively struggle against systems of power. So in that sense, we segue again with this rejection of political parties and hierarchical political organization because uh, it's just the power of the masses. You know, it's not a class or a cross-class alliance that would have structured party form that could leverage power against imperialist states. So if you combine all three of those light motifs, what we basically have is a set of um, orientations that are absolutely guaranteed to fail against highly organized political states with extremely hierarchical militaries that will absolutely crush and destroy people who aren't properly organized. And so in many ways, these three leitmotifs reveal at a material level of political organizing the payoff from the Western Marxist, and that is basically a politics of failure and a politics of defeat. And they're literally telling us and encouraging us to engage in political tactics that have systematically failed in history. This obviously reveals once again that they are anti-socialist and they're against anti-imperialist Marxism. One of the fascinating things I found when I was uh, in the US for the first time, I was uh, volunteering with, uh, with uh, a, a, a union which organizes basically informal workers in, in, in the Midwest region. Uh, I think it's called Mid Midwest Workers Association. I went to some of those uh, very impoverished areas in Chicago and I was organizing there. 
And the union leaders had very clear instruction for, our, for us, the volunteers, that start by saying we don't work with the government. And I was like stunned because in, in, even in India, where the, the state is so weak in terms of its developmental capacity, when you say that I work for the government, the poor people, the working class has a very positive uh, sentiment towards it because they view the state as a developmental state uh, primarily, even, though, even, even when they know that the state has betrayed their popular aspiration, while on the West, there is particularly, I would say, in the U.S., maybe not as much in Scandinavia and parts of Western Europe today, uh, but in the U.S., this absolute lunacy um, that the state is is somehow um, a, a, a all evil, and that's where I think people like Milton Friedman and others uh, built on and sort of cannibalized this this idea. Um, and I think this brings us to uh, your own work uh, of the theory industry and the primacy of uh, the US and the rise of US to this global power after the Second World War. So can you tell us a little bit about why Lucerto himself uh, is not an Anderson in the sense that he is not cited as extensively as an Anderson or everyone whom he critiques in his book and what did you try to do by editing his volume? Well, I think that the key concept for kind of framing all of this is the imperial superstructure, right? So the superstructure Marx didn't understand as like literally there was this, you know, form that uh, arose on the economic base, but instead it was a way of indexing how given global relations of production, there are specific political legal forms or states that arise, like the imperialist states that we have, that are bourgeois democracies in the sense that they're the most impoverished democracies that capital can buy, meaning they're democracies that function for the bourgeoisie. But that's also conjoined with a second element of the superstructure, which is the cultural apparatus. It's the entire system of cultural production, distribution, and consumption, which includes the world of ideas, the world of journalism, but also the world of entertainment and the arts. And within that overall imperial superstructure, there has been a kind of colonization, if you will, of Marxism and the Marxist discourse, such that the major power brokers within the imperial core concerning what Marxism is are these Western Marxists. They are people like Perry Anderson, who of course is involved in New Left uh, Review, New Left Books become Verso Books. There are many other examples. La Fabrique in France is a kind of sister publishing house that I would point to. And they're enormous power brokers and gatekeepers. And so one of the things that they've done, some people probably are aware of this, is that, and I don't know all of the details because it's not part of the public record, but Verso has been opposed to releasing some of Lesordo's work and has been a bulwark against that because they slander him uh, ignorantly as a Stalinist, which he wasn't. I mean, I just said he's on the side of the Sino-Soviet split. He has criticisms of Stalin, etc. And so Lesordo has been kind of, they've tried to put a kind of the scarlet letter on him as being a Stalinist, which is just the most slanderous and heinous form of despicable, uh, moralizing uh, dismissal of all of his excellent materialist work, while at the same time providing an enormous platform for all of the so-called real Marxists who are against actually existing socialism. So what you see is within the imperial core, there is class struggle in theory, but that class struggle in theory is not just being waged between individuals and how they think. It is largely a consequence of the material structures for the production, distribution, and consumption of knowledge. And when you have a sector of the imperial superstructure that's controlled by a kind of radical liberal intelligentsia that is absolutely hostile to even allowing people to be heard who would be of the orientation that Lesordo is, then you have a kind of process of very practical and very material censorship that is operative. 
on the part of the Western Marxists who don't want to give a platform to the Eastern Marxists. I should say, just in the interest of, of nuance, it is true that Verso has published some of Lesordo's books, but they've systematically avoided the books in which he is a much clearer and stronger supporter of actually existing socialism. They've tried to pick the books that would fit within their overall kind of agenda. In that regard, I think that it's very important for us who are dedicated not just to interpreting the world, creating innovative theories, and having a job based on that, but actually think that the world of ideas is a zone of class struggle that is important because and insofar as theory grips the masses and it can actually change the world. And one of the things that we need to do, and many of us are doing, is build material infrastructure to support that type of work due to this widespread censorship, sidelining, banning, etc. And that's a difficult process. And it's one that the gatekeepers do not want to allow us to do. But they're on the wrong side of history at the end of the day. They are on the side of the imperialists. They're not on the side of the working and oppressed masses of the world. And so even though it's a difficult struggle, it is a struggle that is heartening because it's a struggle that's on the right side of history and in the right direction. And I should say not only for the working and oppressed masses of the world, but also just to save the planet and the possibility of a human future, because we need to go socialist if this planet has a future. And that does not mean socialism of ideas. That means socialism of practice and a material practice of socialism. I guess this is my last question, unless I have a follow up um, on what you, you you finally has to have to say. Um, it's a possibility. It's not not um, it's it's not uh, inevitable, but it's a possibility that one can read Lusordo's book as some kind of uh, reinventing the wheels of uh, the splits within the left, um, the kind of second international versus third international positions of Soviet Union, the West versus East. And some people would argue that maybe we can move beyond that. Maybe we can see what's, um, what's there in the West uh, to be to be taken and incorporated and that's maybe that's actually what Lusordo's project is as I understand because he's also talking about rejuvenating the the um, western Marxist canon uh, which is not necessarily Marxist but the western radical canon um, so can you tell us um, um, how does one get the real content of the book uh, because it's very polemical and it's easy to actually divide, uh, you know, the whole content of the book into binaries. And what does he mean um, when he says or when he thinks about reju rejuvenating the Western canon? Yeah, I think that it's important to situate Lesordo within the kind of deep Leninist tradition that he's coming out of. And one of the points that Lenin always insisted on is that we have to learn from every source. So Lenin was very far from the anarchist idea that you would go and burn down bourgeois libraries or throw out bourgeois science or anything like that. It's recognizing that the imperial superstructure, as I was calling it a moment ago, or the forms of knowledge production under the imperial bourgeoisie, at the end of the day, they're the most developed forms of knowledge. Now, it doesn't mean they're the best, right, or the the most politically well-oriented. What it means is that they are the forms of knowledge that have received the most resources, support over time. And so it is certainly the case that within the Western left intelligentsia, we're dealing with people who have the ideal situations for knowledge production. Uh, much more so than Lenin did or, you know, uh, Che in the jungle or Mao, for that matter, you know. And so in that regard, one should expect that there would be elements from those traditions that one could draw on, learn from, but reorient in various ways. In Lesordo's work in general, he has done that, I think, to an extraordinary sort with bourgeois history. If you read closely his book on Stalin, one of the points that he makes is that he cites pretty systematically bourgeois historians. And he says, nobody could suspect these people of communist proclivities. 
uh, they're not ideological in the sense that they'd be oriented towards me, they're oriented against me, but this is what they say. And so in that way, his work does draw on the kind of history of bourgeois knowledge. Now, in this particular book, though, it is true that he's diagnosing more specifically within the Western left intelligentsia, the kind of primary political and ideological orientation, which is against actually existing socialism. And that's his focal point, right? He could have written another book or gone into details of like what might be positive in some of these thinkers in various ways. But the reason to do that, and this is really coming to the last part of your question, is because the goal of the book, granted, it's polemical, most of it is mainly negative, but the real goal and the foundation for the book is the positive project. And the positive project is anti-imperialist Marxism that supports political organizing in the party form, developing socialism in the real world, and leveraging power against imperialism. And so overall, it's that framework that allows him to diagnose all of these problems. The fact that he himself was Italian, born into the Western imperialist world, and is able to diagnose these things and see through them, I think is a testament to the fact that it doesn't matter what culture you're born into or where you are trained, you can reorient your horizons. And so the book is in many ways a kind of call to arms to reinvent and rejuvenate anti-imperialist Marxism that recognizes, and this is kind of coming full circle to one of the things that our, our uh, discussion began with, to recognize that in the struggle to build socialism in the real world, the principal way in which that has manifested itself is as a national struggle for liberation from imperialism. And so Marxism in the real world has quintessentially been an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist Marxism. And that's what he wants to put front and center and have us, you know, really understand that at one level, again, I'm against simplistic binaries, I'm for dialectical analysis, but when push comes to shove in class struggle, there are confrontations. And the book is an invitation for us to either line up on the anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, hence pro-environmental, pro-human project, or against it. And what he's sharing with us is that the Western Marxist tradition has generally been against it, and that we need to know that so that we can orient ourselves correctly in relationship to it. I said this was my last question, but I remember um, a comment from the last episode we did uh, with you, and I think this is uh, uh, important for us because we also hosted uh, Slavoj Zizek, and the comment was, why didn't we ask you particularly uh, to, to comment on Slavoj Zizek? So uh, just in the spirit of transparency, can you uh, tell us your uh, a little bit about your work on Slavoj Zizek? What, what I should say perhaps first, and foremost, that as his work began coming out in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, well into the 21st century, I read every single book as it came out, uh, thought at first that he was an exciting thinker and that he was doing new and innovative things. But my overall analysis at this point in time, I wrote a long article on it that's going to be integrated into a book. Um, and so I've extended that article and that critique is that he's capitalism's court jester. Here is somebody who gives us all of the kind of contumacious uh, rebellionism of a Western Marxist, uh, which he wasn't originally. He cut his teeth fighting the Yugoslav government running for the presidency of um, the breakaway republic while uh, basically claiming that capitalism was necessary in the, um, in the former Yugoslavia and then re later reinvented himself as a Marxist. Um, so he has his own trajectory, which is an opportunist trajectory. He's not someone who's a rigorous scholar. He doesn't know what historical materialist research is. He reduces dialectics to what Lenin had presciently called a toy rattle. So it basically means, well, you shake things this way, you shake them that way, and they're a little bit different, different, and you just keep saying different things. That's not dialectical analysis. And he has made an enormous career for himself by being bolstered by 
the major corporations in the imperial core, universities, publishing houses, etc., the capitalist ruling class, the art world, and other such things. And that's always been his goal, was to be a kind of opportunist sellout. Well, he wasn't even a sellout because he was just an opportunist from the get-go. To be a sellout, you actually have to have principles and then sell them out. That wasn't the case for him. And he is opposed not only to actually existing socialism, but he's came out, come out repeatedly on the side of NATO, imperialism, the EU project. And uh, in that regard, he is in many ways indicative of these very sloppy opportunistic positions where someone poses as a Marxist, but is actually a supporter of various forms quite directly of fascism and that has a lot of play and gets a lot of play in the capitalist world. So we shouldn't be confused by the this charlatan, um, because that's ultimately what he is. Um, and in that regard, I know that uh, he has made some brief public responses to some of my work, where he basically tried to either lump what I'm saying into critiques of his work that, you know, he couldn't lump them into because it didn't fit, or saying that somehow I was just affiliated with Lesordo and using the Stalinist label, which is completely inappropriate at every possible level. Because what you do if you can't deal with the message, what I'd love is a reasoned response to the criticisms that I've put forth. The man will not give that because he's incapable of giving it. And also because ultimately he doesn't have a leg to stand on. And in that regard, calling out his opportunism, I think, is very important and very much in line, not with some Stalinist version of Lesordo, because that doesn't even exist, as I explained before, but in line with what class struggle in theory looks like. And at times in class struggle in theory, you have to call a spade a spade. You have to call an opportunist an opportunist. You have to call capitalism's court jester, capitalism's court jester. And that's what he is. I, I never found Zizek's work very uh, careful because of his very casual use of labels and, 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 and categories. I mean, and this is where I think many of other thinkers whom you have critiqued and Lusordo has critiqued, many of them at least appear as uh, serious scholars, even, even when I don't agree on some of their political positions. Um, Zizek seems very much like an entertainer who sort of, you know, uh, um, caters to, to his crowd. He came to our show and said Deng Xiaoping uh, was a fascist. And I was like, like, like people with very bare minimum of literacy on China would be like appalled by this label. Um, he also called for benevolent dictatorship being more important for the global South, which also uh, is so much of a shock given those of us in the global South think our history has been for struggle for democracy to begin with against imperialism and then uh, against our own bourgeoisie and, and continued global capitalism. Um, but yeah, I, I needed to ask this because some of our viewers said I had to ask you. I didn't ask you because I didn't even consider his work very, uh, very important. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, can can yeah. I just add one thing on that quickly is that we shouldn't forget that the court jester is a symptom of the system that produced the court jester. So Zizek himself as a person, his intellectual production, I don't think is actually that interesting. It's sloppy across the board. It's very messy, but he's a product of a system that the imperial superstructure that wants to send a message, particularly to young people, particularly the kind of YouTube crowd and the people that are easily accessible, that Marxism is something like this caricature of a person and a personality, which is Zizek. And so I see him as the kind of fecal matter that's been produced by a very perverse imperial superstructure that wants us to identify Marxism and the Marxist tradition with this kind of fecal matter. In my opinion, it is therefore very important to be crystal clear. It's not this sloppy mess that is Marxism. Marxism is rigorous, it's serious, it's systematic, and it's dedicated to improving the world, not to simply promoting oneself as a court jester and getting all of the returns that come from King Capital that this man has already gotten. So I just wanted to make sure that people 
always you keep the system in mind and don't get, get distracted by fecal matter. That's a very important point. Um, I, I, I uh, uh, as you were speaking, I thought of uh, it must be that apparatus that led to uh, Zizak defending Marxism against Jordan Peterson. Um, none of them are uh, either serious critique of uh, uh, of left and Marxism or uh, you know serious scholar on Marxism, but there is this one joker who critiqued. Uh, the whole canon of the left by perhaps not even reading the Communist Manifesto, and then one kind of market celebrity to defend, um, you know, uh, in the name of Marxism. And I think that reflects how impoverished on one hand, the whole theory industry is, but on the other hand, how much of crowd they actually pull, so whether it's in YouTube or sometimes in academia and so on. So I think, I think it's a good uh, annotation to make that his work might be sloppy for a serious reader, but the impact is 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 enormous, and that's why it, sometimes you have to stop and critique those works. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Professor Rob Hill, uh, thank you so much for your generous time. Um, it was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for the great work that you're doing. Keep it up; it's greatly appreciated. My name is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotishman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. Please do consider donating for the cause link is in the description below also if you are not able to do so don't feel sad you can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades finally don't forget to hit the subscribe button